Hey, Pastor Mike here. I just want to thank you for tuning in and let you know that we have more resources like this available for you on our website. Just a quick note before we begin, though. While resources like this can help you grow in ways that God has ordained for you, they are no replacement for gathering with your local church on Sunday. And on that note, if you're not currently connected somewhere, we want you to know you're always invited to Grace Point. Visit our website for time and location, and we hope to see you soon. Last week, we began our two-sermon mini-series on healings, uh, looking at specific passages from the Gospel of Luke. Rather than taking them one passage at a time, they, they are all teaching on the same idea. So this is our second week, uh, looking at eight or nine different individual healings, depending on how you divide it up. And where we find Jesus this morning, he's in the middle of a transition. And usually the middle of a transition is not where you draw meaning from, <laughs> because a transition is about getting from what we were talking about to what we're going to talk about. And right here in the middle of a transition, there is meaning. There's something that happens that we can realize, and it's really where we begin. It's not what you heard read. We're going to get to the healing of the paralytic man a little later in the sermon, but where we begin, Jesus has been in Capernaum. Uh, doing a, a, a multiple healings, and he's about to leave the town of Capernaum and go on a little short journey and then come back to the Sea of Galilee, to the shore, where you have already heard he will call his first disciple after preaching on his boat. So we're kind of going out of order here, as you can tell. But as he leaves town, something specific happens that's really interesting, and that's where I want to begin here today. And you can just listen to this. This is the end of chapter 4 of the Gospel of Luke, verses 42 and 43, 43 and 44. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place, and the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in synagogues in Judea. And we know he's also going to go heal this paralytic man that you just heard taught about as, as Tim was reading. So he has thing, other things he has to go on about his business and do. And what I want you to do is think about this verse. He's in a transition. He's going from a series of some events on his way to a series of other events. And he has a reason for transitioning and saying, I can't stay where I am. I have to go where I'm needed. I, it's not Jesus saying, I'm not needed where I am, but he has, has other things that are God's will for him to go accomplish. So I want to help you think now. You're, you're zoomed into that verse. Now zoom out and think of the big picture of why that would be. Why would that be? Think about, think about it this way. <laughs> Jesus needs to fulfill his next purpose, and he's going onward to the next purpose. And there are some times, as we can tell from the people in this verse, where what people want and Jesus must go accomplish are two different things. And that's where we start in the text today. People wanting to actually hold on and stop the Son of Man from leaving Capernaum. And it's the first point that we can go ahead and put on the screen. What they want is out of sync with what Jesus must go do at this point in time. That's just something we need to see in our Bible. It, just, it happens all the time. Peter cuts off a guy's ear because he doesn't want Jesus arrested. This happens all the time. What happens at the transfiguration? The same guy, Peter, now that I think about it, there's a pattern here. Peter says, let's create three tents so we can just make this moment last forever. <laughs> Jesus has things he's accomplishing, places he's going, places he's teaching, places he's healing. But we see these people say, can it last forever? Can't what you're doing right now in Capernaum, can't it just go on and on and on and we'll bring you a, a line of endless people to heal? Can't we keep doing that? And they would have kept him from leaving had he not said, I must go and teach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. What does he have to go do? In part, he has to go set into motion the series of events that will lead to calling Peter after the miracle he's going to perform for Peter. That's really important. Why is that important? Why is calling Peter important? Well, later on, Jesus is going to say, I'm going to build my church on this rock. Peter's name meant rock. 
I'm going to build my church on this rock. So Jesus is actually, he, the reason he needs to move on is because he needs to set into motion the actions that will lead to the building up of his kingdom. And that's what it says. I've got to preach the good news of the kingdom. Not only that, he's got to call the people into the kingdom along the way that are meant to be in this kingdom. And not only that, the crucial leaders that will help for the building of this kingdom called the church. He's come to call his first disciple, and he's going to be on his way to do that soon. This little passage just is one example, such a transition that you'd probably usually read through and just kind of say, okay, that was a transition. There's no meaning there. It points out to us that Jesus came for a series of divine purposes. Each person brought to him was specifically brought to him for a purpose, for him to heal and teach. There's nothing that he does by happenstance. And that's where we begin today, a very intentional Lord transitioning out of one series of healings, like you heard last week, into another series of healings. Would these people have stopped him, though? You have to ask, would these people have stopped him if they realized where their true hope was going to be found in this kingdom he was going to go build? And you actually think about why they're wanting him to stop. Stop, don't go do that. Keep healing here in Capernaum. Don't go build your kingdom. He has this greater purpose. Would they have stopped him if they knew what he was going to go do? Build his kingdom. Preach the news of his kingdom. Ultimately, go die to establish the, the truth of the gospel and the opportunity for forgiveness by placing your faith in his death and resurrection. Would they have stopped him? Would you? From their point of view, they're literally saying, Jesus... Jesus, don't go give me a new life. Stay here and fix up the one I have. Jesus, don't move on and do something, do anything that's going to establish the opportunity for eternal life. Can't you stay in Capernaum and just keep renovating the life I have? This is kind of like us when we demand healing and want healing and aren't looking down through the tunnel of eternity like God does. These people don't see the grand eternal purpose of what Jesus has come to accomplish. They want the finite. They want the thing fixed now. And don't think you wouldn't do the same. It might sound a little different this side of the cross, but we might have similar conversations with Jesus today. We might insist, heal me now, Lord. And even if God's response is, are you sure? Are you sure you want me to heal you? Even if the result is not as good as the result we're working towards now? If you could see what I see, would you still be saying, stay in Capernaum? Would you still be saying, heal me of the thing I think I need healing of? If, if Jesus said, are you sure? We've never been so close as we are now. You hear me? That thing you demand or want healing from desperately, would you still want it if it meant, I'm not going to rely on Jesus as much as if I get healed? Maybe we have a conversation. We say, Lord, I insist, please heal me now. And God's response might be, are you sure that sickness is the reason you're desperate for me? The answer is yes, we would still ask you're convicted probably, but the answer is yes. We would still want, we'd still want the immediacy that they wanted rather than saying, is there a grander purpose? Rather than praying things like your will be done like last week, like we heard Jesus praying from the garden last week. We would all probably pray for the immediate need. We do every day. We spend our time praying for what's right in front of our face. Why? Because that's what ails you. <laughs> that's what's hurting you here and now. We don't most of us aren't really good at looking down to the future and anticipating what's going to hurt us in the future, what diseases I could have in the future, what opportunities there could be in the future. We are in the here and now and therefore pray in the here and now and tend to pray, pray responsively rather than proactively. And they're praying responsively. And we would do the same thing. And the people would have kept him from leaving. The people would have kept him off the cross if they could have if it would mean that their immediate problems could be healed. That's remarkable to think about. They would have kept him from leaving. Now, this little transition passage, which again, sometimes can get skipped over the, the same way the first three sentences of each book of the Bible can get skipped over. You know you've done it. You know you do it with the epistles. 
The Apostle Paul to the church at Galatia, grace and peace be with you. Move on, move on, move on. You don't think about the meaning of that important nugget of truth that's in that. And what is here? It's that we're fickle. It is that we have fickle hearts. We want solutions for the immediate rather than thinking long term. This passage just honestly might be a a simple reminder for some of us just to take a deep breath, look up and look around (laughs) rather than looking down and looking at the immediate, looking at the temporary. And in this passage, this short little verse here might, might be a reminder to us to remember that desperation always, always, desperation always breeds bias. Desperation always breeds bias. Nothing makes us blinder to the big picture than the pain of the moment. There's, so it's not just there's sometimes. I know I said, can we go back to the points? I said there's sometimes a difference between what people want. There is often, I'll just say, when you hear it like that, there's often a vast difference between what people want and what God wants to accomplish. The immediate that we think we need a solution for, but we might not see problems as the blessing that they are and the big picture that God is trying to accomplish. We also see, as we proceed, that people are not always available and willing to receive healing. It's just the reality of it. People are not always available. They're not always willing. They're not always seeking healing. That's that's a fact. I shared last week about a brother who I, I, I met and I had the opportunity to know for a good amount of time who was praying for healing in his marriage, praying for marital issues that had just been plaguing him and his wife. And it was only many years, I believe five or six years in that he finally realized, maybe I'm not praying the right thing. Maybe the, this is a little bit of demonic oppression here. Maybe we need to pray for, for, for the Lord to like rebuke evil in Jesus' name to to keep outside influences from having a continued influence in our marriage so we can finally have the kind of oneness, um, not self-seeking, but other-seeking, other-focused, spouse-focused marriage that we want, this partnership. People are not always seeking healing. People are not always thinking about all the things that actually ail them. Again, we focus on the immediacy of the moment And sometimes that gives us blinders to reality. Again, remember, nothing makes you more biased than your own pain. People are not always available and and willing to receive healing. And we see that in the passage that Elder Tim read. I mean, you see this this passage. It's verses 17 through 26 in in chapter 5. One of those days, Jesus is teaching the Pharisees and the law of the and the teachers of the law are all sitting around him, and a man, a paralytic who can't get to Jesus, is brought to Jesus on a bed, presumably by four friends. It doesn't say, but I think tradition is there are four guys, each holding a corner of this bed, and trying to get this guy in to see Jesus. If, for instance, if Jesus was in a home, right? Like seems it sounds like he is, because they lowered him in from the roof. Whatever it takes to get to Jesus, they're gonna do. This could be a whole sermon. It almost became a whole sermon. But I don't know that we need to do that when, when you all are in life groups, right? Get in a life group. And you'll be able to go unpack every ounce of this. But I want to give you at least three or four things to think about about this passage. And, um, because I could take an hour, hour and a half just to unpack everything that's happening here. But I want you to think about some things. A few key things. Ready? Number one. This passage is a beautiful illustration of intercession. We're not on to the next point. Can we go back to the verse, please? This passage is a beautiful example of intercession, intercessory prayer. We talked about that last week. If your friend doesn't know what they ought to pray, you can pray for them, and that's a way of getting them up on their bed and leading them into the presence of Jesus and say, Jesus, please do something. Please heal. Please guide. Please convict. Please correct. This is a beautiful image of intercession, of doing for others what they may struggle to even be able to do or aware of their need. The paralytic feels too weak to get to Jesus, and some friends say, you know what, that's completely fine. We're going to take you in to see him ourselves. You you know what, you don't need to worry about how to get to him. We'll solve that. We're going to usher you into his presence. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Active service. 
Another thing, number two, forgiveness of sins is better than telling a man to walk. I don't think we believe that. Just frankly, go back to what I said earlier. We'd be like, make me walk, Lord. We'll figure out the sin thing on my deathbed. You might as well say amen, because most of you, if you were mute or deaf or, or unable to walk would be, or, or had cancer or had a, an autoimmune disease, you would be saying, mm, boy, it is tempting to have that solved now than have this other issue solved forever. Telling the man to walk was better for him, was, was not as good for him as telling him his sins are forgiven. When he comes into Jesus' presence and Jesus sees his faith, he doesn't say, wow, walk. He sees his faith and goes, you believe in the Messiah. Guess what? You're forgiven of your sins. That's great news for him. That's the best news he could have gotten all day. But I think we read this and read into it how crappy it would be not to be able to walk. And we go, oh boy, he had his biggest problem solved. And we wouldn't be saying it because of his first words to the man. We'd be saying it because of how the, 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 par- the uh, it's not a parable, of how this narrative ends. We'd be saying, look, he finally got what he wanted his whole life, to be able to walk. Wrong teaching here. Wrong teaching. Forgiveness of sins is better than telling a man to walk. Number three, Jesus heals with both immediate purpose and greater purpose. He does heal. He heals him, yes. But he does it for an immediate purpose that the man may walk and for a greater purpose. What was the greater purpose? You can see it in there. Why do, you, why do your hearts question? And he asks them, you're questioning whether I'm the Messiah. You're questioning whether I can actually forgive this man's uh, sin, right? Because they say, who is this that thinks he can forgive sin? Well, he says, if you think that's hard, what's harder, to tell a man to walk or to tell a a man his sins are forgiven. And I would ask you the same. Now you might say, it's harder to forgive sins. Any fake magician off the road can say your sins are forgiven and it can't be proven. The thing that can be proven right or wrong is whether he says, get up and walk. That they can get immediate proof for whether or not this guy can truly heal. And he says, I'm doing this not so that he will walk. I'm doing it so that you will know what? That the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I'm healing his temporary issue, not just because of the temporary issue, though he will go away walking and running and skipping and swimming and doing beautiful things he hasn't done in a long time. And I'm sure that would bring Jesus great joy. But the reason Jesus calls out is that you may know that I can do what you can't see. I can forgive his sins. So Jesus Jesus does both. He heals for an immediate purpose and a greater purpose. And number four, the passage is a timeless illustration of the distance between Jesus and the unforgiven. This man couldn't walk. But his his worst problem was that he was unforgiven of his sins. He was walking around unrepentant, having having not placed his faith in the Messiah. That's something that the, the text says happens here at the moment he sees Jesus, experiences Jesus. Jesus sees their faith of the moment, the faith of we have to get to him. He is the only way. There's no other way to be healed. And Jesus just watches that happen and goes, that's faith. You don't do that. You don't bust up a friend's roof unless you've just got a really good reason. You're confident good's going to come from this. Amen? They, they are confident, absolutely sold out on the idea, this is the Messiah, this is the only way for healing, and they come to find out this is the only way for the forgiveness of sins. It's profound. This is billions of people right now, though who don't have a friend to grab the corners of the bed and usher them into the presence of Jesus. Billions of people around the world right now. When I said people are not always available and willing to receive healing, I'm not just talking about people who have a Bible. I am talking about, but I'm not just talking about people who have a Bible full of answers sitting on the shelf and collecting dust. I'm talking about people without access to a Bible without access to Jesus, having not heard the name Jesus, 
having not heard the gospel in their language, or understand, are unable to understand that Jesus loves them, not just the people who speak English or, or, or have the Bible in their own language. There are people around the world who don't have a friend or an ability or a mechanism to usher them into the presence of Jesus. Now, when you hear that, how does that not, how can it not change your heart for missions and make you think, I gotta find a bed corner to grab? There are people laying on beds around the world, spiritual beds, unforgiven of their sins, having never heard the gospel, with no one to show them how to get to it or no one willing to bring Jesus to them. When you hear that, you got to think, as a Christian, i got to find a bed corner to grab. How can I not? How can I not if this is the case? People aren't just sometimes willingly unavailable to the gospel. Very often, they have no access to it. No access to it at all. The church must do this. It's our purpose. Go and make disciples of all the nations. That's a call to find a bed corner to grab and get someone into the presence of Jesus, whether it's you grabbing your Bible and opening it with them. It's you inviting them to a, 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 an outreach event, a life group study, anything where they're going to get the gospel into their life. That is you lowering them in through a roof. This text doesn't just say something about people seeking healing for immediate purposes. It says something profound about global, domestic, citywide missions in 2023. There are many ways we do this. There are many ways. Some of us get on planes and we go. Some of us can't, so we support the people who can. That's really the only two categories. There wasn't a third option on that list. Did you hear me? That, that get with the program. You either go or you support people who can go. There's no other, it, there's no other option when there's people who need to be ushered into the presence of Jesus or need selfless people to take Jesus into their presence. Via, via the Bible in their language or preaching in their language. In January, we're doing a, another trip to Cuba. I'm not going alone this time. A, a team of people from Grace Point are going. And I hope you'll consider giving. If you can't go, I hope you'll consider giving to that so that other people can go. It's an exciting trip because we get to actually build relationships with churches that we think are like-minded in eastern Cuba and see what God does from that, of us being able to support and, and go into a city and say, okay, where, where are the beds? Where are the people on the beds? Where can I grab a bed corner? How can I find a bed corner to grab and lift and go? That's exciting. You can pray for your church and you can pray for the team that does go. If you've experienced the love of Christ, how can you not be a goer in your heart? I went to a seminary, and the whole slogan of the seminary is profound, right? Go. That was it, right? It's, isn't that good? Just, you know, I, I, we, might have another sem we might have another slogan that's like on the business cards or something, but that's not what you see. What you see everywhere is go. Go. How can you not be a goer if someone went for you? If Jesus sent someone to go for you, we turn around and we become goers and we support goers and our heart beats for going. And we know that by living here in St. Cloud, this is us, many of us going. Kids, when you, when you go into your school tomorrow, you're going. When you go into your workplaces, you're going and you're going in Jesus' name. And people around you might not realize you're walking in with the bed like, hey, I, I got a whole mattress and I'm willing to carry anyone to Jesus today. What you do, you go. You go. People are not always equally available and willing to receive healing, and sometimes they are not even aware that they are sick. But it is reassuring that, number three, the power and authority and will of Jesus Christ can breach any barrier that we perceive between us and any type of healing. Whether it's, I don't know if my sins can be forgiven, or I don't know if Jesus even cares uh, about my eczema or my fever, like Peter's, Peter's mother-in-law, right? Like Jesus, can, his power and authority and his will can, can breach any barrier that we perceive between us and healing. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9 of chapter 7. 1 through 9. 
After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. So we're back at Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick, and at the point of death, who was highly valued by the centurion. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him elders of the Jews. He didn't go himself, but he sent elders of the Jews. This is a Roman centurion sending Jewish elders to go talk to Jesus, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when, he came to Je- when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, this centurion is a worthy man. He's worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, meaning Israel, and he is the one and he is the one who built us our synagogue. So this is a, a, a Roman centurion who looks favorably on the Jewish people. You don't hear about this very often. So they, they're willing to go to Jesus on this centurion's behalf, right? And Jesus went with them. So he, Jesus responds, and he's on his way to go heal, presumably. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, now I want to pause. Why would he not run out and meet Jesus? Probably for the same reason he didn't go see Jesus himself. Whatever that is, right? Like, we'll get to what some possibilities could be. He doesn't go meet Jesus himself. He sent out friends again. He just doesn't want to talk directly to Jesus, but he admires him and believes he can heal his servant, right? He says, they say to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself. Speaking on the centurion's behalf, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I do not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am like you, a man under authority with soldiers unto me. I I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, I say, come, and he has to come. And to my servant, I say, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not Even in Israel have I found such faith. The the linchpin for understanding this is found in those words, I too am a man under authority. And if you kind of fill that out with with what words we might add to in English, it means I too am like you, a man under authority. Meaning the centurion believes Jesus is coming under the authority of someone else the authority of God. So he believes Jesus does what God says must happen. So the centurion thinks the only hope when he hears about the Messiah, the, this Jesus, whose, whose healings are, are, the rumor of his healings are spreading, the rumors of his teachings are spreading by this point. When, he, the, centu- when the centurion hears about this, he thinks this is the hope. This is the only hope for the healing that I need is someone who is under God's authority, absolute authority. I too am like you, a man under authority. And I say, whatever I say, therefore, goes. What authority is the centurion under? A local governor, a local Roman governor, maybe. And we can balance that by saying, and Jesus is under the authority of the Father. And he sees them as the same. So in other words, he's saying, I'm just like you. I can just say it, and it happens. So I don't need you to come under my roof. It's totally fine for you just to, where you are, say, be healed. You don't have to come touch him. I just believe that because your authority is to a higher authority, you can just say it wherever you are. And that's just true. That's absolutely true. We don't have to be in a certain way, in a certain position to pray. You don't pray a certain prayer to get saved. Jesus listens. The man on the bed didn't pray the sinner's prayer in order to get saved. All he did was bust through a roof and he was called faithful. Just say the word, Jesus, and I know my servant will be healed. Jesus sits on a throne today. He was authoritative then. He's authoritative now. And this centurion likely feels a sense of unworthiness, which is why he doesn't want to meet him in person, but trusts in his authority to heal. Look at, look at the, the next verse. Verse 10. And when those who had been sent 
returned to the house, they found the servant well. Put yourself in their perspective. They run out, they talk to Jesus, and they're like, our, our, our boss said, just stay where you're at and say he's healed. Good? Good. And they run back to the house and they go into the house and the guy's alive again. That's how it worked from their perspective. They show back up and they go, wow, that was fast. I'm not going to lie. That was super duper fast. <laughs> we probably didn't expect it. They probably didn't expect it to happen that way, but they go back into the house and he's already healed. What a faith moment that had to be for them because whoever the centurion has said this man is, this man just proved it. This man is under some kind of authority that enables him to have the power of life and death itself. Power over life and death itself. As, uh, as the lead singer of Leland says in their live recording of Waymaker, his name is above. His name is above depression. His name is above loneliness. His name is above disease. His name is above cancer. His name is above every other name. And this centurion knew it. And that Jesus called faith unlike I've seen in all, even in Israel. Even in the people who should have faith in me, I haven't seen that kind of faith. It's profound. Jesus has absolute authority over everything. Absolute authority. You may ask, so how does, the, how does the series on healings end if we've seen Jesus always does what's right? He has absolute authority. He doesn't have to come lay hands on me for to be healed. He on his throne can snap his fingers or say, I will, like we saw last week, or it is done, you are healed. Uh, what great faith. He could say any of the words he chooses, but according to his will, if he wills it, it will be done that there's healing. So if Jesus can, then what's he waiting for when it comes to me, Pastor? Why doesn't he cure my anger? Why doesn't he heal my anger? I ask every day for him to heal my anger. Why won't he do it? Why won't he heal my lust? Doesn't he see what it's doing to our relationship? Why won't he just take this thorn away from me? Why won't he heal my cancer, heal my autoimmune disease? Why won't he heal my bitterness from the last pastor or church that hurt me or from my ex-wife or ex-husband or my present wife or present husband? Why won't he heal me? What is he waiting on if he can do these things? That is, that is so valid. Let me first come validate you. I don't know if you need that this morning, but those are questions you should wrestle with. My guess is Jesus wants you wrestling with it if you're asking it. I'm sure people in these passages wrestled with why, why won't our friend be healed? We've taken him to every Pharisee there is. He's been prayed over by every religious leader. What are you waiting on, God? Don't you think they asked the same thing? Don't you think the, the people in the centurion's household thought, well, we could have been more proactive in getting him the, the, the medical attention he needs. If, the, if the, the God of the Jews is real, then maybe the moment the centurion thought about healing, it should have happened. God knew his thoughts right then. Why the whole episode? Why the delay? Why couldn't it have happened instantly? People wrestle with the same thing all the time in Scripture. Why would God allow Peter to fail him three times? Why let him? Why not just say, don't fail me, idiot? Don't fail me. And don't do it three times. At least do it once. Come on. Why let people fail? Why let people be sick? Why not? Well, that's the fall. That's the fallen world we live in. That stems all the way back from the garden and from our sin nature, our decision as humans to introduce and our forefathers, our great-grandmother and great-grandpappy's decision to eat fruit from a tree they shouldn't have, to be tempted to do things their own way, to trade in law and fellowship with God for a world full of disease and sin. And that's just the, the reality of it. Any of us who thinks we would have done different than Adam and Eve are lying to ourselves. So, why does he delay? If he knows the world is sinful, why not just, or why not just take me now? Why, make, why let me suffer? You should always remember. Number four, Jesus knows what it means to be in deep, unrelenting pain. You cry out, 
to God with those ideas, those weaknesses, those valid questions. You cry out to him, but you don't cry out. You don't cry out like Muslims do. You don't cry out like Hindus do. You cry out to the only faith that offers a suffering servant, that offers a Lord who suffers like you, who was tempted like you and did not sin, but knows unrelenting pain. Name me another God who knows unrelenting pain. All other religions say, you will die for me. Christianity is the only religion that offers a God who says, I will die for you. He knows deep, unrelenting pain, and therefore he is a sympathetic, empathetic Lord, unlike any other. Look at these, look at these verses with me. It's where we conclude today. Soon after, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And he drew near to the gate of the town. And behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the son of his mother, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when they saw the Lord, and when the Lord saw her, rather, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. And then he came up and he touched the buyer and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all. And they glorified God saying, a great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding countryside. When he saw her, he had compassion. Jesus is not unsympathetic. So the one you cry out to and say, why not me? Why yet? Why am I still suffering? Is not someone who does not sympathize with what you are going to. We see a Jesus who is compassionate here. Look at the Jesus that's on the page. Don't listen to the people who don't know Jesus tell you about who they think Jesus is. Listen to who he says he is. He says, I am a compassionate Lord. So you can talk to him like a compassionate friend who knows what you're going through. Does he really? I'll get to that. Try to imagine, though, watching this scene. He walks up. He touches the buyer. It's like, think of it like another type of bed, but on this one, you carry a dead person from place to place, whether it's to be, depending on the culture of the time, ritually burned or buried, put in a tomb. Think of it um, not like a coffin, but a, um, oh, the word is escaping me now, a pyre, like a, a pyre. It could be something you carry uh, but it would, be, it would be mobile, so multiple people could carry it, which is why there are bearers. Today we call them pallbearers, right? They carry the coffin. Here they're carrying the dead son. And Jesus watch, walks up and just touches it. Everyone around would have gone, ooh, creepy. No, that makes us ritually unclean. You can't do that. Who is this guy? He must be a Gentile. He must not know. This makes him unclean. So none of us can touch him. This has become detestable. And not only that, he goes up and starts talking to the dead guy. Most of us have been to funerals, and your heart is incredibly gripped when you hear a loved one talk to their deceased loved one, because this is the moment, and I'll never forget my grandmother saying, John, why did you leave me? John, and they were married 70-something years, 72, I think, and it was too soon for her. I loved their love. I loved their love. And she said, John, why? So sometimes those words are incredibly touching, but this is not one of those moments. <laughs> This is walking up to a dead guy like he's alive. He looks unclean and looks like a lunatic. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or a lord, says C.S. Lewis, and he's kind of about to show which one he is. And the man gets up and talks, and it's normal. And he had a meal that night. It proves he is fully functioning and restored to life instantaneously. Jesus proves his power again over life and death and his ability to heal. And he does it out of what? A sense of compassion. It's easy to miss things like this or take them out of context, but put yourself in the shoes of the people who were there, and it's a profound scene, and it's no wonder when someone gets up out of the coffin, something has gone wrong, right? 
Something has gone wrong at the morgue. Something is wrong. So fear seizes them. But when they start to realize what has happened, that news just spreads everywhere. Because there's only one way to interpret what happened that day among, by the way, a great many witnesses. So don't think it was a lie. It's recorded for us so that we may know and have faith in this man who controls life and death. But what do you mean that Jesus knows unrelenting pain? Because he was compassionate? Because he was just compassionate with this woman? Oh, I want you to think about this woman. This woman just lost her son, and she's a widow, and she's alone. I just described her, but I also just described Mary after Jesus' death. She has lost her son. She is a widow. She's alone. And those are three things that Jesus' mother is going to feel, and Jesus knows it. There's no way that Jesus didn't see this woman and feel a, I just believe it with my heart of hearts, even though the text doesn't say it. And I know, pastor, that's ice of Jesus. I'm sorry, that's inference, and that's gotta be the case. There's no way that our Lord, with a perfect mind and awareness of all things, didn't look at those three things. She lost her son, she is now a widow, and she's alone, and think, my mother, when I am crucified, will watch me be crucified. And, and when I breathe my final breath, she will share these things in common. Jesus knows deep, unrelenting pain and has known it most of his life and has known what his mother's going to go through, has known what he's going to feel and what she's going to feel and how it's going to pain him to leave her and descend into the grave. He's human. He's God, too. He gets you. He gets us. He sees his mother's future plight. But not only that, this was her only son. Did you catch that? This was her only son. And if you believe that what Jesus said is true, which is he is one with the father, then Jesus looks at this loss of an only son and is able in that moment to also see with his perfect Jesus mind and empathize with the father who's going to watch his only son crucified. There's so much here in this passage that says Jesus is empathetic. This woman, one woman's plight represents multiple angles for how we will see the cross. He, and he, does he, Jesus feel bad? Oh boy, this just hit me. I love when things occur in the pulpit. Oh, does Jesus spend his time feeling bad for himself and saying, oh me, my poor death. He has compassion on her. Does he depart into the countryside to weep? No. He has compassion for her and her circumstance. He is other-focused here. That is profoundly compassionate and profoundly loving. Don't discredit Jesus who sees what you're going through, loves you more than you love your own life and loves your children and, and your spouse more than you could ever love them and feels compassion when he sees you go through what you go through because he has suffered and he has watched and prepared his whole life to watch his own mother suffer and he himself will suffer. The love of Jesus is pure. It is God wrapped up in a man who lives the human experience, loving and experiencing love, though he experiences suffering, he never turns inward, never gets bitter, because he's the perfect law follower, who even despite this, still heals. Still heals. I, I love the image of, of Jesus here, a, likely drawing the parallel between this and his mother's uh, loneliness, and he does what is right anyway. We ended last week with a point, Jesus always does what is right. He doesn't retreat, he does what is right. It, it reminds me, my son's first sermon he ever preached, he preached on the feeding of the 5,000. And when, while him and I were studying it, I, for the first time it clicked for me. Jesus feeds those 5,000 when he'd rather be on a boat retreating across a lake because his cousin had just died by beheading. And he stays. And it says there too, he had compassion when the disciples wanted to send the 5,000 away, he stayed and he did what is right. So if you say, Lord, why are you waiting? And you might say, Pastor, what is the Lord waiting on? He's still good. He's good. And whatever plan he has must be so crazy good. 
that the, the weight will be worth it or the weight will, be, will seem sovereign in hindsight. He is good. His love is pure. He always does what is moral. He always does what is right. He empathizes with your pain. And through his blood shed on the cross, we are... He is good. He is good. And he will go all the way to the cross. Those people who wanted to keep him where he was at, I can only imagine when they get to heaven, they'll go, oh, I can't believe we were so short-sighted. And I think sometimes we will do the same. After a long time of praying for the same thing, whether it's a healing or a breakthrough or a miracle, after a long time of praying for the same thing, we will come to the what seems like the obvious conclusion at some point, many of us, and go, I can't believe I was so far-sighted. So, and nearsighted, couldn't see what was right in front of me because I couldn't see what was up ahead of me, but he could. I want to leave you with some advice from Paul King. It's advice for worshiping while you're waiting. Worshiping while you're waiting for healing because it is possible, as he puts it, to dance when you're down in the pit. It doesn't have to be a place of a dirge. It doesn't have to be a place of just sitting in sackcloth and ashes, Old Testament style. It can be a place where you dance in the pit. And he gives some advice. He says, exult in the midst of a pit. In other words, take joy in who God is when you're in the pit. The test of our faithfulness, he says, is the perseverance, the, the, the test of our faithfulness and perseverance is when we can praise God, even when it seems like he has abandoned us, this is enduring faith. I never really fully understood this, he writes, this concept of taking joy in my tribu tribulation until I realized during my cancer ordeal that the only thing I could do, the only thing left, the only way I could survive was by praising God in my agony. I had to choose to dance in the pit of my despair. And he says, number two, acknowledge God as the source of your strength and your hope. Acknowledge that God is the source of your salvation, the source of your strength. You can hope. You don't have to have despair. Number three, declare the greatness of God. When it seemed like everything was going wrong in my life, he writes, I heard a scripture song based on Deuteronomy 32 that brought me to tears and, and worked deep inner healing in my life. In the midst of your deep distress or disease, take the advice I receive from this song and the remaining four are from this song. Ascribe greatness to God. And when, even when God's greatness is not evident, when the evidence appears contrary, when others or yourself question, where is your God? Declare him your rock. Stand on him as your firm foundation. When all else is shaky and insecure, declare him your security. Declare that his work is perfect, that God's work is complete, whole, not lacking anything. I once heard Corey Ten Boom saying that we see the entanglement of threads on the back of the tapestry rather than the beautiful tapestry on the other side. Declare that God is good, upright, just, and that God is faithful. Confess that his ways are right and wise and moral. There's no fault, no unfairness, no lawlessness in him. When it seems like injustice reigns and God does not seem to act, trust God that he is good and will bring good out of injustice. As David wrote, "My, I, I would have despaired unless I had believed in the goodness of the Lord. Even when God seems silent, he writes, when he seems absent or indifferent or God seems just missing, MIA in the battle, confess with your heart and believe with your mouth. I said that wrong. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Some of you didn't even catch it. Confess this. Great is thy faithfulness. You've never once let me down. There is great power in giving thanks while you're in the pit. Power over your soul. Things the Spirit can work out in you when you worship and dance in the pit. 
and believe this song, the song we sing today, if nothing else, the song we conclude with today. It's your breath in my lungs. So I pour out my praise. So long as there's air in your lungs, it belongs to him. So use it to magnify him. Use it to teach of him. Use it to glorify him. To evangelize others into belief in him. That more would glorify. As someone once said, one of the severest tests of Christian character is the ability to wait on God without losing patience with him. Be patient. He is patient with you. Lord, we know you are. Your word says that you are. When the persecuted believers that Peter wrote to were facing their persecution, you told them, you reminded them of the long view of eternity and that you are not a slow-paced, slow-acting God. You take direct, intentional, pure action motivated by love. And we thank you for your love this morning. I want to pray, Lord, too, for those who are waiting healing in our congregation. What, what time to be praying on healing when we are praying for Christy to be supernaturally healed? We, we're not going to stop lifting our petitions because you also tell us to, to make our petitions known to you. So we keep petitioning you for her absolute, miraculous healing. We pray for anyone else in this room who is dealing with other forms of cancer, leukemia, thinking of those brothers and sisters who have uh, autoimmune disorder, Lyme disease, other, other things, ailments I don't know about, things that are changing everyday life and causing sometimes intense suffering. Lord, it is not easy to be in this body, and we know that you know that. So we believe that we're talking to a purely loving, empathizing, sympathizing God. When we ask for healing, we ask for strength, and we ask for the motivation to dance even when we are in the pit of our own despair, to never stop glorifying you with every breath we have so long that is, it is in our lungs to give. We observe you now in communion and praise you in Jesus' name.